Yeah, Chuck. Let me get off the phone. You're on the wrong phone. I took the good car to me on this phone. Sir. No, you ain't tell me that. All right, all right, all right. Okay, bro. What you want me to do with you, guy? You want me to leave? Take it to the house. Give me a call when they get you out. I already got me on the phone. Oh, man. Um, I don't know how to tell you, but I got this motherfucker stuffed like a motherfucking baked potato. Do what you gotta do. Get out the here so you can breathe. On a trip to L.A. in 1999, Meech's dream of breaking into the music industry became possible when he was introduced to a young, aspiring artist named Barima McKnight, who was rapping under the name Blue Da Vinci. They shared a common vision, and Meech took an immediate affection to the young artist, Shortly after, the two founded BMF Entertainment. For the entire lifespan of the record label, Blue Da Vinci was the only artist signed. What we're focusing on right now is Blue Da Vinci. I believe that more, most labels take so much time out and focus on so many artists that you can never get the realness out of the one artist because you're focusing on 10 or 20 artists. That's why all our independent focus is on what Blue Da Vinci gonna do. If he take off, then we take off. If he don't take off, then we don't want to take off. Simple. The business that they chose to hide behind, to use as cover, was also an industry that was critical for improving their reputation and providing them with the social capital that they needed. It created loyalty, it created a mystique, it created interest, and it provided a fantastic cover for them. It was totally realistic. When you, when you see these guys and say, well, they're part of the music industry, they look the part, they act the part, they understand the culture of the hip-hop lifestyle. It's not like they were trying to open up, you know, a bunch of uh, McDonald's or something like that. And this BMF entertainment thing is, is more than just a record label production, some niggas doing music or just some street niggas. Man. This is really all about going state to state and linking up motherfuckers from the streets, man, from all over, no matter where you're from. No matter what you look like, how fat you are, or whatever, you know, niggas that got a little money and a lot of sense, man, we looking for them. and start making some of these black dollars happen. One of Big Meech's biggest self-proclaimed legacies was that he unified gangs from all over the country. Crips, Bloods, GDs, BPs. They all stood together underneath his black flag. And we got all type of niggas around here. It's short niggas, tall niggas, bald niggas, light skin, dark skin, braids, dreads, fat, whatever you want. We do it all, we don't discriminate. Matter of fact, after you leave here, you end up getting your teeth on something and coming up with something better. You know what I'm saying? Like a new car, a new house, maybe the kids get to go to school, private school, pay for, courtesy of the mob. You know what I'm saying? We pay. You know, that's simple. A lot of niggas don't like to spend their money. We love to spend our money. We can't take none of this shit with us. This phenomenon is a testament to how BMF grew. Most guys who want to establish a drug empire, they're gonna go off of the stereotype of what you believe you have to do to get there. And part of that is the violence. With daily images of cartel-related bloodshed being broadcast from the southern borders and gang violence running rampant in our own cities, we have an immediate prejudice that the drug trade goes hand in hand with violence. Meech and Terry took a different approach to extend their reach. Upon entering new territories, they presented themselves as businessmen, and through diplomacy, they created alliances with existing criminal entities. They kept their eye on the ball, because you know, you get enough bodies laying around and law enforcement attention is going to come your way probably faster than when there's not that type of activity. In a way that's what made them so successful because of, they never engaged in a lot of violence so that the attention was never drawn to them in the way that it might be to another group of people. As much as Meech was a natural negotiator, the bottom line was probably the most persuasive element in BMF's success. With their vast supply, the brothers offered kilos of coke for only 17 grand, two to three thousand dollars less than their competitors. Hello. 
Hello? Uncle Duty, wrong phone. Huh? Wrong phone. What up, though? What up? Hey, did you need a new chip to the new phone? What's this phone like? My new check. What's one? The last one I got? The new chip. What you do with the phone that I get? Oh, yeah. I still got it. No, he ain't give it to me. He said he couldn't get a hold of Doug or some bullshit, and I had to leave. Right, you got the old phone? Yeah. All right, you got it on you? Yeah, I ain't got no time on it, though. You told me to burn out the time. Often, while we were intercepting Terry talking on a particular phone, he would be using uh, push-to-talk phones in the background, having other conversations. So he, he had multiple phones going at any one time, and then, of course, had a reserve of phones for him and his organization members. So about the best thing we could do was, as Terry would transition from one phone to another, was to try to keep pace and spin to the next phone. And we successfully did that with about three of Terry's phones. The DEA sat back and listened for five months as Terry laid out the foundations of their investigation. It is from this monitoring that we're able to find out information about the participants or co-conspirators. We're also able to determine whether or not there is any drug activity taking place. We were able to listen to Terry direct a driver to take some kilograms of coke down to Louisville, Kentucky for distribution. That aided us in conducting a traffic stop and seizing 10 kilos in that particular load vehicle. This case could have ended with the wiretap on Terry's phone. The DEA had him directing a guy to take the dope down south. They intercepted that car, got the dope. There was a decision made, DEA, IRS, and with the blessings of the prosecutor's office, that, you know, we're going to take it as far as we can go. You know, we're going to identify all the members of this organization. We're going to identify all the people who are helping them launder their money. And that's what happened. Over the course of five months, the DEA compiled over 900 pages of transcripts from Terry's phone calls. But there was not one phone call between Terry and Meech. Terry used to like to dilute and reconstitute his kilograms, stretching the number of kilograms to increase his profits, while Meech's theory was, don't sit on it, move it, and, and he enjoyed a reputation of, of distributing very pure kilograms. So on the street, Terry's cocaine was referred to as Moet. Not bad champagne, but Meech is referred to as Cristal, top shelf champagne. A couple of months before we initiated our wiretap in April of 2004, while Demetrius was on house arrest down in the Atlanta area, his underboss, Chad Brown, was going around talking to Terry's customers, saying, Terry's dope is no good. He dilutes it, it's poor quality, you should be buying dope from Demetrius and our side. That upset Terry very much. So Terry took a group of individuals and confronted Chad Brown in a house that was full of girls, his friends, and embarrassed him and was screaming and yelling, waving the gun around, accusing him of, of attacking Terry's livelihood. Demetrius believed that Terry should have had that conversation with him out of loyalty for his side of the organization. He said, Terry may be my brother, but we're done. And it probably was the reason that we were unable to uh, identify a phone for Demetrius and never successfully intercepted any of his phone calls. We coming in at the top of the game. We got all, all the cars we want, all the houses we want, all the clothes we want, all the jewelry we want, and all the hoes we want. And we don't need nothing else but to make good music. By 2004, Meech had solidified himself as a public figure. He was actively sponsoring young rappers in and around Atlanta. His father was a musician. He surrounded himself with musicians. I think that he had a genuine love of the rap scene in Atlanta in particular, which was blowing up in a big way at the time, in large part thanks to his willingness to sort of sponsor rappers. He really did think that if he could get one big break on his record label, that he might be able to stop with the illegal stuff. Maybe that's not reality, but that's what he said. Meech pumped excessive amounts of money into Blue's hip-hop career, believing that his financial backing could launch a young rapper into stardom. At a time when most record labels were faltering and budgets for music videos were being trimmed, Meech spent a little over $500,000 on a little-known track, We're Still Here. And 
instead of getting five artists, get up, put a hundred thousand a piece into each one of those artists, and you're doing everything small. If you put the whole million dollars or five hundred thousand dollars behind Blue Da Vinci, now you got a big project. It looks big and everything bubble. But if you just put a hundred thousand between between these five artists. And, and you got cheap project, nobody may not recognize none of the five. Yo, BMF Entertainment is in the house, you guys. If y'all haven't seen it, you just don't know. The hype seemed to have an impact. BMF's image, street credibility, and apparent success attracted many rising artists. Blue Da Vinci was seen in many music videos with Young Jeezy and Fabulous, and he was regularly collaborating with known acts including Jadakiss and Nelly. Some nigga, it's a real movement going on right here. Young Blue Da Vinci, Young Jeezy, Baby D, and the rest of the motherfuckers that roll with the BMF Entertainment Squadron, nickel.